This is Kitco News special coverage of the Pacific Bitcoin Festival in Los Angeles, California. Welcome back to our coverage of Pacific Bitcoin. I'm Michelle McCory. Elon Musk recently posted on X that fiat is a scam so normalized that we've forgotten it's a scam. Well, my next guest couldn't agree more and thinks that fiat ruins everything and must be destroyed. Jimmy Song is a Bitcoin developer, educator, author, and entrepreneur. He's a programmer with over 20 years experience and open source contributor to many different Bitcoin projects. The author of several books, including Programming Bitcoin and the recently released Fiat Ruins Everything. Jimmy has been a lecturer at the University of Texas and an expert witness in legal cases involving Bitcoin and is also an advisor to multiple companies. So excited to have you with us, Jimmy. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be on this show, and I'm very excited to talk about the book. Well, it's a fantastic read, and I love the way you interspersed history and facts with observation and a little bit of humor at the end of each section before it gets too bleak and too depressing. But in the book, you make the case that the debasement of our money is the root of all evil, essentially that all of our problems stem from the system of fiat currency and central banks. And you write, like a zombie master, central banks have turned every organization into its slave, and much of civilization now lives a zombie-like existence. This is the debasement you've been feeling your whole life and the reason why everything seems to be slowly deteriorating. All right, so you do make the case in the book and you get into the specifics of how fiat every ruins everything from investments to relationships to science to art and we'll break those down in specifics but before we get there give us the overall big picture the broad thesis of how fiat ruins everything yeah so fiat uh what i mean by that is fiat money obviously and it is the system of central banking that is allowed to put new money into existence and the existence of somebody that can do that changes the incentives all over the place uh, in our personal lives, we don't have savings vehicles, so that changes our behavior or the incentives that most people have. Um, at, companies have access to these large loans, and that means that they have to be big enough to qualify for these loans and oftentimes are able to live out an existence without really providing value to anybody, without really needing to make that much of a profit, uh, if any. And, uh, and that causes... Uh, distorted incentives all over the place in the economy. Um, governments have the ability to print money for to buy votes, essentially, or to you know, prolong their power. Um, and that, that's led to a lot of distorted incentives. And certainly at the global level, the US has the ability to print the world reserve currency. And that means that it is dominant in foreign affairs. And we, we've so, seen that since 1944 or so. Uh, but all, all of that together means that things are just all very different than they would be without the presence of fiat money. And I trace in this book the many different ways in which fiat money ruins the incentives of uh, particular industries and uh, relationships and things like that. And one of the central themes behind all of this that reaches all of these aspects is how fiat leads to short-term pursuits. Expand on that idea. Yeah, so uh, low time preference just means that you have uh, you are willing to wait for something. High time preference behavior is what a lot of people engage in. If you're yoloing or foloing or something like that, that's that's what we would call uh, high time preference behavior. Uh, what the basing money does is that it it causes you to want to spend it rather than save it because saving it is a lot of work. In order to keep the value that you have, you have to put a lot of time and energy into investments, savings vehicles, um, maintaining those investments, and so on. And the, that's a lot of time and effort and energy that's taken away from you rather than, uh, you know, pursuing something more fruitful, like providing value to other people through the market process of providing goods and services. So what that means is that you have a lot of uh, people that are pursuing um, uh, you know, uh, investment, but you also have a lot of people that don't want to bother, so they will just go and spend the money. And this is where you get high time preference behavior, where they're consuming a lot of different things and uh, rather than thinking about uh, you know what what might happen in the long term, they're more focused on 
you know, sort of living it up now, right? Uh, it's it's the very essence of um, like an undisciplined person. Uh, and if you're a parent, uh, I'm sure you're very well aware of a lot of children having high time preference behavior and lengthening that time preference and uh, making it so that they value the future properly is one, one of your um, duties as a parent. And unfortunately, um, fiat money sort of goes against that. So we've become a society of instant gratification yes. because of this high time preference that fiat forces us mm -hmm. into seeing. And therefore you say it impacts morality. Mm -hmm. Fiat money leads to fiat morality, you're right. Thus the debasement of money also leads to a debasement of trust and ultimately a debasement of moral standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of uh, a lot of different things change when the money is debasing very quickly. So, uh, you know, one of the sacred things in a market is a contract, right? If I if you and I have a contract, you're supposed to supply me shoes or something, and I I supply you with money. Uh, if the money is debasing, that contract doesn't really stay the same. The circumstances are changing too quickly, and uh, and that means that I am going to maybe fill the letter of the contract, but I'm going to slow walk everything if, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I think the shoes are too expensive, for example, or if the, if the shoes are too, uh, too cheap, then maybe you're going to slow walk and like, make, it, make it very difficult for me to uh, get the shoes. And that, that fluctuation of value, uh, of, uh, of the debasement of the value of the currency means that uh, people are not going to necessarily um, be as moral as they would be if things were more constant. So because the currency is debasing, you get a lot of immoral behavior that happens in the economy. And that, that's just one very concrete example of contracts. You, you have a lot of other things like uh, you know, people engaging in a lot of uh, rent seeking, um, you know, doing things that are more financial and uh, taking advantage of the money printer to, uh, you know, make a lot of money off of people that uh, are uh, that are not aware of what's going on and so on. And yeah. you, do, you do use the term rent seekers a lot throughout the book. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So rent seeking, as I define it, is somebody that gets in the middle of a transaction that two parties would normally engage in. So if I'm trading with you on something, the uh, rent seeking party comes in usually as a gatekeeper or something like that uh, to grant permission for that transaction to happen. Now, in a free market economy, all transactions are sort of bilateral. If I give you money for shoes, then you give me the shoes and no one else is the wiser. And I really like shoes, Jimmy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but if you have a third party that says, okay, well, I am going to be taxing your transaction, right, by either collecting money or um, forcing certain standards on the shoes or something like that, then that, that party is essentially a rent seeker. They are taxing a transaction, a bilateral transaction, and they're they're sort of coming in the middle and collecting something off of it. Mm -hmm. That's re, uh, that's adding a lot of friction to uh, our transaction without adding really any value. Right. And that that's uh, inherent all over the economy. There's a lot of people that engage in rent seeking, and I call them sort of economic leeches. Mm -hmm. uh, they they cause everything to slow down and um, you know stagnate rather than uh, progress and innovate. And that is another thing that you highlight in the book is that people rent seeking or seeking money and looking for careers as investment bankers instead of as inventors, for example, mm -hmm. because you make more money being an investment banker or high frequency trader than you potentially would as an inventor is leading to a decay and in progress for mm -hmm. a lot of society and civilization. And you write that fiat money has in fact caused civilization to regress. Mm -hmm. Those who in another era would have been inventors are today's investment bankers. The incentives are skewed. Merit is no longer a consideration. So it's no surprise we're experiencing technical, political, and moral regression as a civilization. But you could argue that it's not disincentivizing people because they're motivated to get the fiat. So they want to invent something in order to make more fiat. Because fiat is so fleeting, you're kind of driven to maybe work harder to get it and come up with a solution that brings you more fiat. 
Yeah, and and people certainly do that. It just turns out that going down the invention route or serving the market route is significantly more difficult than going down the rent-seeking route of investment banking, for example. Banking is the ultimate rent-seeking position where you're sort of getting in the middle of people's money and collecting money uh, in some way from that. Uh, And what, what we've seen is that the best and the brightest of the last 50 years, the, the people that are graduating from the best colleges and so on, they, they go into investment banking, not because they have such a love of investment banking. It's because that's the place to make the most money for the least amount of time. You're seeing salaries of hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, what, for what? Well, you're leveraging this trade and doing that. And I guess suppo- I, I suppose they can say I'm providing liquidity to some market or something like that. But they're not providing a good or service. And it's much easier to make money that way than to, say, invent a nuclear jet engine for planes or something like that. And that, that's the problem, is that in a fiat economy, you have this alternate way of making money, which involves rent seeking, which involves basically getting in good with the money printer. Um, you know, uh, just to give you an example, if you uh, you know, go up the ladder as and figure out a way to become a general eventually, right through the military. Um, you can, uh, after you retire, you can go found a defense contractor company, and you can make hundreds of millions of dollars making weapons that don't work, right? And and that that's a way in which you can make money that's uh that's a lot easier and a lot more secure than actually creating a good or service that the economy might want. This this person probably hasn't created anything in their lives. But, you know, because they, they've gotten in good with the money printer, essentially the bureaucracy of government, they're able to make hundreds of millions of dollars doing, doing stuff like that. But wouldn't people still be interested in creating wealth if we had a different money system? I mean, when we, before fiat, people were interested in, in bettering their position financially. So can we really make that connection? Well, so if, if you're creating goods or services for the market in a sound money economy, you, you make money and that's that's great. But there are no easy rent seeking ways to make money in a uh, in a sound money economy. In a fiat money economy, there are so many ways you can do that. You could be like an investment banker. You, you really do not like investment bankers <laughs> and you like shoes. This is, a, this is a takeaway I'm getting so far. Right. Uh, I, I mean, there, there's so many ways in which you can be a rent seeker in this economy. Uh, and, you know, I, I categorize a lot of HR as that, right, where you're essentially um, providing government compliance in some way, shape or form mm-hmm. uh, and not really adding to the actual business, which is providing a good or service to the customer. So you have, you have a lot of that sort of thing, which pays very well. Um, you know, I, I, I give the example of like Twitter, for example. When uh, when Elon Musk took it over, you know he fired ninety percent of the people. Well, what were all those people doing? Because the site is running fine. What 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 happened? Well, they were probably largely rent seeking, right? They they were censoring news or um, you know doing various functions that didn't really matter or add value to the actual customers. And that, that's, uh, that's sort of like an indicator of how much friction you're adding to the entire market uh, by, by adding all of this rent seeking instead of, so to answer your question, if you are an inventor, if you are trying to create something like that, you can make money in a fiat money system. It's just you, because of all the friction that exists, you're going to make less mm-hmm. and you're, you're going to do way better putting that effort into rent seeking instead. And unsurprisingly, a lot of people go to rent seeking. I mean, obviously, this is a big generalization. You could invent something that makes you billions, but yeah. I, I, I get the broader point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You did write that you think that we peaked as a civilization in 1969 mm-hmm. when we landed a man on the moon. Since then, our achievements haven't propelled humanity forward, but turned us inward. At best, we've managed to preserve what we already have. At worst, we're undoing humanity's progress. Now, coincidentally, we went off the gold standard in 1971. So if you say we peaked in 1969, two years later, we went off the gold standard. What is the connection there? I mean, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I, I will point out that we haven't been back to the moon, right, since uh, since the Apollo program. And I think uh, the last man on the moon was like 1973 or something like that. And 
in a sense, you can, you can sort of see the decline in space exploration and frontier pushing as uh, a canary in a coal mine, so, sort of showing that we're not really going forward anymore, where we've turned it instead inward. And w when I say we've turned inward, all, all of the sort of like technological um, breakthroughs since that time have mostly been around communication or better forms of entertainment or something like that, rather than actually pushing the frontier forward. We, we don't have better airplanes, for example. We, we had the Concorde, right, that stopped running, uh, I think, in the early 2000s. Uh, we, we haven't progressed at all in that direction. Um, dishwashers from the 60s ran in 45 minutes and got your dishes sparkling clean. Our dishwashers now take three and a half hours and they sort of get them clean, right? Like there, there's something regress, regressive about fiat money. Now, what's the actual mechanism? My, uh, my thesis in the book is that uh, under a fiat economy, when you have a large company, uh, they tend to stay there because they have all of these political advantages. In a normal functioning economy... The Cantillion effect, yeah. which you mentioned. Yeah, uh, and, and that's, uh, that, that's because they have access to newly printed money. They, they can get these large loans uh, through commercial bond market, and you know, the, the banks will essentially print money to help these large players. And they can live out kind of a zombie-like existence. One of the chapters in the book that I talk about is airlines are now like these zombie companies. They're, they're essentially banks at this point. Uh, and I point out that during the pandemic, we saw that these investment banks want, wanted to give these airlines loans. And usually in the past, they would, uh, the, the loans would be collateralized against the actual airplanes that the air, airlines had. This time, they collateralized it against the miles programs of these companies. And so they had to value the miles programs. And it turned out that the United Miles Plus program was more valuable than the market cap of United itself. It's kind of like finding out that you have an $800,000 kitchen in a, in a house that's worth 500000 It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It's really the opposite. It's that they're a bank and that the airline part of the bank is, is actually used to discharge debt and it's actually a money loser. Um, and th those are the games that every large company plays is financial games and they, they're able to stay in their position instead of being competed out of the market. They just sort of live out a zombie existence and keep everything static. And, uh, and as a result, we see societal decline, civilization decline. Right. And I think one of the interesting points that you made out is this whole, again, short term time frames mm -hmm. doesn't allow people to plan, doesn't allow people to sow seeds for future mm -hmm. generations. Something that you say Bitcoin mm -hmm. does fix. But before we get into that, let's let's elaborate a little bit more on that idea, because I found it was very interesting mm -hmm. where you said fiat money makes us obsessed with money mm -hmm. in terms of how we now preserve the value of the money that we've made. We have to do homework and research to find investments to retain the money that we've made because we can't just earn it mm -hmm. and leave it and go on developing relationships with people or with families or other pursuits of culture and art that potentially help civilization more. And I particularly like this paragraph. You write, fiat obsession with money makes us, um, fiat money makes us obsessed with money. It does this by causing us to pay too much attention to it, like a Kardashian to a camera. Because fiat money is continually being debased. People with any wealth at all are forced to invest their money to keep up with that debasement. The more wealth you have, the more obsessed you must be. The moderately wealthy research stock and real estate. The very rich have to research venture funds, private equity, and special purpose acquisition companies. And the truly rich hire an entire staff of people in family offices to do their investing. In a fiat economy, you must make money twice, once to earn it and once to keep it. So I thought that was a very interesting point. And you break down how these various asset classes are not actually working for us. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, and yeah, you have to look at the monetary expansion of the U.S. dollar to really understand, because um, the, the thing that all of these investments are measured in are the dollar, but the 
dollar itself is debasing. So if you have a measuring stick that's changing, you're, it's not really a very good way to measure what's going on. I think you cite in the book that what since 1913, since the Fed mm-hmm. was created, um, the dollar has lost, what, 97% of its purchasing power? Right. Uh, what, that's one way to look at it based on CPI and so on. Uh, another way to look at it is just to look at the entire M2 money supply. That's one of the measures of all the money in the world. Um, in 1959, uh, the M2 money supply of the U.S. dollar was $289 billion. Currently, it is nor- upwards of $21 trillion. So if you annualize that from 1959 to 2023, I think that's uh, like uh, 74 years or something like that. And and uh, it, it's 70x over that time. It ends up being about 7% a year. So you're getting a 7% debasement in terms of the fraction of dollars that you have over all of them. Uh, the CPI is a little bit of a different number because it, it's measuring specific goods and services and whether they're going up. So you can think of CPI um, partly as like a government manipulated metric, but it's monetary expansion minus sort of technological improvement. And uh, even that is, you know, uh, debasing. So we're forced to take this debasement or we can try to keep up with it. It's kind of like running on a treadmill. In order to stand still, you have to get at least 7%. And that 7% hurdle is what every investment <laughs> guru is measured on. If you Do you get over 7% or under 7%? It's really just, all right, can you stay on the treadmill <laughs> and, and, and run at this rate? Um, um, and unfortunately, that, that's what people are forced to do. And these are people that have made money. And if they did make money uh, providing goods and services to the economy, then they've created something useful. They're spending all of this time in keeping their money that could be going towards creating new goods and services that we might all benefit from. Instead, you get, you know, uh, like uh, a typical thing that happens is a, a successful founder has had a successful exit. Now, now they're now an angel investor right? <laughs> in, in so many different um, startups or whatever. They're, they're not really providing value anymore. They're, they're just sort of like the money changer or bank at this point uh, and trying to keep up with the 7% debasement every year. Right. And as you say, it results in a waste of time and effort that could be spent producing goods, services, things that further mankind and civilization. And you make the point that this debasement of fiat and devaluation has forced people to use their homes as an investment vehicle, which is not what essentially a home is supposed to be. And then that obviously drives up home prices, making shelter a basic requirement Mm -hmm. unaffordable Mm -hmm. to most people. Mm -hmm. And that we don't actually ever really own our homes. You (laughs) you make that point as well, that we think we take this money, we put it in a home, Mm -hmm. but even then you don't own it because you have to pay taxes on it. Mm For starters, I mean, there are usually other sort of fees with depending on what kind of infrastructure runs with the home. And you also make the point that if the government wanted to, it could take your home and decide, you know, what the fair value is. So elaborate more on this idea how people have been forced to use their homes as a primary saving vehicle because of this debasement. Yeah, you had this debasement and what people try to do to combat that uh, debasement is to find good savings vehicles, uh, some way to outrun the monetary expansion that's happening. And two of the more popular ones, in, in fact, there, there aren't that many to be, to be clear, uh, two of the more popular ones are stocks and real estate. And uh, th- those are very popular because they're easy to understand. Um, Real estate is particularly nice because they're not really making any more land. So there's some guarantee of scarcity. Uh, stocks are also nice because there's a limited amount and uh, or usually unless they're issuing new stock or something like that. So um, people have used those two stores of value as a way to outrun the monetary expansion that's happening. Uh, what that means is that there's now a store value premium on both those things, uh, and we can get into stocks later, but particularly in housing, you get a store value premium because people expect it to keep its value. So um, if you look at it as a pure asset and not, not an investment vehicle, like uh, you know you were evaluating as a bond or something like that, then you would say, okay, what's the actual income that this could generate? Um, and then based on that, uh, you know, uh, you you would get the right price uh, uh, on that. It, it's not like that anymore. It's it's based on the store of value premium that it has. Uh, means that 
the people that are buying it are buying it to keep their value. So uh, I, I read uh, uh, an analysis of all the luxury condos in New York, for example. A significant percentage of them are empty. Why? Because people are using those as stores of value, a way to keep their money because they know that that's a very desirable piece of real estate. They're not even bothering to rent it out because they want to keep it pristine. Uh, you know, entire buildings in or cities in China have uh, you know these ghost cities, and that's because store of value. Uh, you know, that real estate is a good store of value rather than the crappy currency that they're forced to deal with. So, all that means is that. Uh, Prices of homes are significantly higher than they would be without this uh, store of value premium. There's also, you know, the entire mortgage loan market and, uh, you know, how it's uh, made special uh, than other things. So if you look at like your interest rates on a credit card versus a mortgage, it's, you know, the credit cards were way higher. Uh, and part of that is that there's a subsidy for mortgages uh, that, that happens in most countries. So. All that's to say that the people that actually want to buy a home uh, for other purposes, for you know, it being a home, they're sort of like priced out uh, by yeah. the people that are using it as an investment vehicle. Right, because there are very few alternatives available to, to people that really retain the value. You mentioned shares and investing in stocks, and you say that you know there was a time when buying a share meant you believed in a certain company's ability to make a product. Mm -hmm and sell that product, and then you as a shareholder benefit from the productivity there, benefit from the revenue and profit generated by selling mm -hmm. that product. Yeah. But now with the stock market, we are so divorced from the fundamentals mm -hmm. of what's behind these companies when we have this ridiculous evaluations. If we look at current price to earnings ratios, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's completely out of sync. And a lot of people put money in stocks, not even looking at potential price to earnings, but because they think the sentiment around that stock will cause it to go up. Mm -hmm. So people think, oh, this will earn, and then therefore it's popular, and that popularity drives more money into that. So, I would, which I thought was you know, a very mm -hmm. interesting way. And, and to illustrate that, you, mm -hmm. you wrote that dividends aren't drivers of stock anymore, mm -hmm. um, and they used to be. Because that used to make sense, right? You're right. Um, the average dividend offered by a company in the S&P 500 as of June 2023, around 1.6% annually. By contrast, during the gold standard era, Standard Oil famously paid dividends as high as 33%. Okay, well, oil is a whole other conversation. And obviously, <laughs> oil was booming at the time. But you keep on going back to the gold standard in your book. Is that to say you believe money was sound under the gold standard? Uh, much sounder than it is now. Now, there, there were sort of machinations and weird fractional reserve banking things that were happening to sort of expand the money supply sort of in a stealth way. But for the most part, it was much more sound than it is now. And I, I would say that with stocks in particular, dividends used to be the reason why people invested in stocks. It was, okay, I'm going to get this much of a return and that's it. Nowadays, it's about the price appreciation of the stock itself mm -hmm. and not the dividend at all. Um, I point out in the book, for example, that Amazon in its almost 30 year history at this point has never paid a dividend. Zero dividend. And it's one of the highest flying stocks ever. It, it, it's unclear if they'll ever pay a dividend. Um, but you know the the price continues to go up because other people know about it, and there's retail mind share. It's it's what we would call like Keynesian beauty contest. It's it's based on okay, well you know like that one's popular, that one's popular. Um, there's a chapter I wrote in the book called P the Triumph of Postmodern Investing, mm -hmm. and that that's what this has turned into. It's about will to power. It's it's not about the fundamentals or the cash flows at all. Uh, when when you get something like the meme stocks that we saw, um, you know, GameStop was the famous one, AMC was, was another one. But the most egregious, in my opinion, was Hertz. It was a bankrupt stock, and it kept going up because they wanted it to go up. It has zero value, like for, on a, on any sort of fundamental basis. Yet it went up because these people wanted it to go up. And this is the dynamic that we find in a lot of altcoins and a lot of uh, like something like Dogecoin, for example, has no purported utility, no purported uh, roadmap or anything. Any, it's just a meme stock. And yet it goes up based on popularity, perception of what other people will do. And that's, uh, that's unfortunately the result of 
sort of the the reality being taken out. It's uh, it, when you have easy money, when you have such abundant money, people will put it into stuff just almost as a gamble because you can't just hold it. Otherwise, you're getting the base 7%. So people are way more willing to gamble with their money and see see where where it'll go uh, because they they need to keep up with that uh, monetary. And some would take that argument and put it towards Bitcoin. Now I know that you offer Bitcoin as a solution to this fiat problem in the book, but some would say, well, you know, that's how we saw Bitcoin run up. It it doesn't have any intrinsic value. You you write that the impact of asset inflation uh, leads to people valuing things that are scarce. Mm. And you write in the book that you, we have highly speculative prices for items like Michael Jordan, you know, rookie cards or certain paintings, when no good stores of value exist and liquid assets like stocks only, uh, only keep pace with monetary expansion, other scarce assets become more attractive. Mm. Now, to play devil's advocate, some people would say, well, that argument applies to Bitcoin, right? There's nowhere to put the money. Bitcoin has seemed to be scarce. It is 21 million capped supply, but it doesn't have the intrinsic value that you're searching for because at least, you know, if I buy a painting, I can look at it. Or if I buy, you know, a famous athlete's shoes, I could maybe wear them. At, at some point, right back to your <laughs> So why does Bitcoin not fall into this category of people had nothing to do with fiat, they threw it into Bitcoin looking for something scarce, and how does that actually produce a good or service? Yeah, uh, certainly the price of Bitcoin does have some, some of that um, dynamic going for it because it is a good store of value and people do want to not get the base uh, on, on the dollars that they're holding, so they, they want to put it somewhere else. Um, now, if you're, if you're doing that with stocks or real estate or so on, uh, they're much poorer stores of value, I would argue, because real estate, lots of transaction costs, lots of taxes, uh, stock, you, you're subject to all sorts of vulnerabilities. If the executive team decides to embezzle a bunch of money or even go in the wrong direction in terms of new products or something like that, you're screwed, which is why a lot of stock... Um, Analysts are obsessed with diversification and so on. Right, but you were making the point mm. that this asset inflation mm. and money debasement mm. is mm. forcing people to look at things mm. by the merit of them being scarce mm -hmm. and just because they're scarce. Mm. So why well, does Bitcoin offer something more than then, just being mm -hmm. scarce? Well, there, there's no guarantee that this other stuff will stay scarce, right? So if you if you are getting real estate, there can always be more condos that are coming on the market or something like that. If you're getting into stock, they can always issue more stock. Or there, the the risk profile for a lot of this other stuff is is higher, and and that's that's the key. So like you could invest, for example, in um, like Lego sets, for example. Some some of them have beaten the seven percent hurdle mark, but. If if too many people go into it, then you know, like, and then Lego will make more of those sets or something like that. There there are lots of ways, and or you know, counterfeiters will make fake sets or something like that. This is a, this is a common problem with Michael Jordan rookie cards, for example. There's all sorts of counterfeits. Well, Bitcoin has these properties that not only is it scarce, but it's very easy to verify that it is scarce and you got the real thing. Um, it's also divisible. You don't you don't have to um, sell a $2 million Michael Jordan rookie car to, you know, like get the benefits of it. Uh, you, you can sell parts of a Bitcoin or, and so on. Uh, and, you know, you don't have to pay to secure it and so on. There, There's a lot of payment that you need to make sure that the corners on a Michael Jordan rookie card are perfect and so on. So a uh, lot, lot of reasons, but uh, essentially what a store of value should be, these are the same properties as money and Bitcoin has the best properties of money. And why wouldn't you go back to mm -hmm. gold? If you said civilization mm -hmm. regressed mm -hmm. after we dropped the gold standard, mm -hmm. why not just go back to a gold standard if, if we're proposing solutions here? Yeah, and uh, I, I think that's actually not a bad idea, but I think Bitcoin is better than gold. Uh, the, the reason why I don't like gold is that it tends to centralize. It is very hard to secure gold. You could put it into your a safe inside your house, but that can easily get stolen. You can bury it in your backyard, that could easily get you lost. 
Um, and trading with physical gold is actually quite difficult. So if I'm ordering something from halfway around the world, well, I have to actually ship that thing, which incurs a lot of risk, or I have to go there myself, which is a lot of time and effort. So, um, you know, this, by the way, was the problem during the gold standard. Treasure, like, there, there was a meme of like treasure ships that got sunk to the bottom. They had to bring the gold with them because they, they had to actually physically trade all, uh, for spices and so on. So um, gold is weak because it's physical. And that means that it produces all sorts of restraints. And this is why uh, banks came up with uh, you know promissory notes and so on, because it was much more convenient than transferring the gold itself. Uh, but that that led to a centralization of gold, which led to fractional reserve banking, which expanded the supply without people really knowing about it. It was fraud, of course, but that 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 was the sort of direction that gold went in. You uh, with Bitcoin, you have this ability to uh, you know transfer it halfway around the world very very quickly, and it's digital. So even if you have you know twenty million dollars worth of Bitcoin, it takes up the same amount of space physically speaking, as like uh, $5. So that those are the advantages and why, uh, and you know, because you can self-custody it, it's not that difficult to secure your Bitcoin and you can back it up and do things that you can't do with a physical property. It's, it's superior uh, to gold and that's, that's why I think it's better. All right, and we will go back to some of the points you made there, but let's focus on fiat being bad mm-hmm. and fiat really destroying societies and civilizations. And and you make a very interesting point how fiat actually ruins marriages, families, and relationships. And and not to necessarily clump them all together, but (laughs) elaborate on that idea. Yeah. So the thing about fiat money is that it it incentivizes sort of like safety nets and things like that, because uh, what governments can offer are... um, sort of uh, insurance or, uh, you know, help during the hard times as a way to win votes. And the, this is what we would call the welfare state. And it's it's a common feature around a lot of these uh, uh, countries that have some sort of central bank. The ability to print money means that, well, you can stay in power by promising free things. <laughs> and unsurprisingly, that's uh, that's something that a lot of people appreciate and will vote for. We're seeing it play out right now. Exactly. Yes, yeah, sure. Exactly. So uh, what happens when you're, you're now dependent more on the government than your family? Well, then family relationships are debased because you don't need to depend on them uh, as much. So in the past, under, say, a sound money standard, you depended on your family to like, pick you up. If you, if you got on, if you were unemployed, you know, they would try to help you find something or hire you even. Um, under, under uh, you know, fiat money, it's, well, okay, the government gives you unemployment insurance, so you don't, you don't need to care as much. Uh, but more importantly, you, you have this uh, direct relationship with the state where the state is providing certain things for you. And that means that you don't have to have the corresponding relationships that you used to have that you depended on to get those things. So, um, you know, even stuff like uh, healthcare and things like that, the, these are now sort of provided by the state. And instead of being engaged in your community and wanting to, uh, you know, engage with uh, in, in relationships and providing value so that you can afford some of this, uh, this stuff or having a large network or community or family where you can go to certain people. Maybe you had a cousin that's a doctor and you can go to them and, you know, uh, get things. It's, it's become very individualized and your relationship with the state becomes uh, the primary relationship rather than your relationship with everybody else. Um, unfortunately, that's meant that uh, you know there, there's been a significant debasement, uh, particularly of children. Uh, children used to be um, thought of as sort of like uh, what, how we view social security now, right? They, these are the people that are going to take care of you in your old age. But instead of a faceless bureaucracy paying you checks, you, you had like warm people that would actually come visit you and take care of you and so on. Um, that That's not as much the case anymore because you, you do have these government subsidies. We have like very depressed old people that are sort of living you know, social security check to social security check with terrible relationship with their kids because they didn't necessarily invest in those things because they had this government backstop. So, um, you know, children uh, in particular were, uh, you know, seen as assets in a lot of families. Uh, every 
uh, if you have a close family, and you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of the people that are watching this show have large families. If you if you have like a cousin that's a doctor or an uncle that's a doctor, and you you have a problem, you that that's who you call up, and that that's that's a much um, more trustworthy thing than going to some government. A uh, healthcare service provider who who knows what incentives that they might have uh, that you know doesn't uh, right. you know diagnose your stuff correctly or says that you have a cavity when you don't or something like that. There, there's all sorts of room for fraud in that, but unfortunately, that's that's the direction that we've gone to because of the existence of Yaman. So we've lost our sense of community, mm-hmm. and. We used to have a community that we could rely on, and partly because of that, we would build that community and strengthen those relationships mm-hmm. for love and friendship, but also, as you say, to provide us with support and, and services. But now we don't need that because we've got governments that print fiat money, which allows them to offer us these services, making us more dependent on the state and therefore subject to their power and overreach potentially as and, well. And compliance. And this, this is the thing. Uh, I, I remember during COVID that one, one of the you know things that was sort of getting popular on Twitter was this idea that if you don't take the vaccination shot, then you should be denied all hospital services and stuff like that. Uh, and th- this is uh, this is part and parcel of every authoritarian government. I um, I talked to Taeyong Ho, who's the highest ranking defector from North Korea a while back. And this is one of the things that he told me was that, uh, you know, Kim Il-sung, who's the original leader of the uh, of the North Korean government, um, he promised lots of things, lots of free things. You'll, you'll have a house, you'll have food, you'll have a job as a way to gain power. But, you know, as soon as you started running out of these things, uh, you know, they, they, they started cutting off the people that were inconvenient. So if you weren't completely for the regime, then your, your house is gone, your job is gone, everything else is gone. You're, you're paying not with money, you're paying with compliance. And that's unfortunately the, the sort of situation we're soon going to find ourselves as sort of the fiscal pressures uh, put a lot of strains on all of these government welfare programs. Right. And w- one of the things back on, on the children's side mm-hmm. could be a coincidence but you did mention how we have now lower birth rates and concerns of depopulation. Mm-hmm. Just 50 years ago, mm-hmm. there was concern of overpopulation. Mm-hmm. And you point out how that narrative has changed and how lower birth rates s- seemingly mm-hmm. coincide with the increase of the money supply. Mm-hmm. And again, moving away from the gold standard and moving away from sound money. Mm. Yeah, the the lower birth rates are a very interesting thing because it, it really is going down almost everywhere in the world. I, I, I traveled in, uh, this past year all over the world with my family, and that was a feature that you saw almost everywhere. And, uh, and there was uh, some statistics uh, released recently. Almost every country now is under um, a fertility rate of 2, and 2.1 is a replacement birth rate. So that means that not all of these are sort of in population decline already. Um, and part, part of the reason there is there, there are fiat money incentives that uh, go towards having less children. So first of all, there's a large bureaucratic state. There's a lot, lot of rent seekers. So uh, everything is more expensive. So almost every household in all, all over the world, both parents are working. And, uh, you know, they, they spin it as women's liberation and so on. But really, it's just us getting poorer. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad worked, my mom stayed at home, and we, we did fine. But nowadays, both parents need to work just to make the ends meet. So that, that money, uh, that, that life sort of getting sucked out of these families, well, if both parents are working, you're kind of capped at two, maybe three kids. You're not going to be able to have much more than that simply because there's not enough resources to raise them up. Um, Then there's also real estate. And as we talked about before, uh, it's getting much more expensive. And certainly for larger families, if you want to have a large family, you need a large house. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That's that's much more expensive. So the people that want to have large families that would make the birth rate higher, they're unable to afford it. And therefore, they they end up having fewer kids as well. So you get a, a whole host of incentives, and I haven't even gotten into child car seats and things like that, which sort of disincentivize having uh, having that many kids because you just can't fit them in a car. Um, 
there, there's a lot, lot of incentives that cause fewer children, and that's playing out everywhere. Well, there was also incentives by certain governments mm -hmm. to have kids that mm -hmm. pay you more the more kids you have, like you know, in Israel, for example. Uh -huh. And and uh, I, I believe in tax, Sweden. And you get tax credits in certain countries for for having more kids. Yeah, uh, and uh, and that's certainly true. Um, but, but but the idea that you have people chasing money because mm -hmm. we can't rely on it mm -hmm. because we can't focus on the long term is distracting from their relationships, from families, mm -hmm. from community. This quest to, as you said, mm -hmm. to not only make money, you have to make it twice. Make it and then keep it is really sucking up a lot of time, energy, mm -hmm. and focus. Mm -hmm. And I thought another interesting point that you made about, you know, fiat money is obviously fake money uh -huh. based on nothing. Uh -huh. And I thought this point was fascinating where you said fake money breeds fake news and fake facts. The fluctuation between acknowledging reality and trying to defy it is a, direct, is a direct result of fiat money. Tragically, our money is synthetic, making it all too simple to suspend reality. To liberate ourselves from this damaging cycle of power plays infiltrating investment markets, we require a solid, dependable, and predictable money. Sound money would root our financial system in reality, ensuring that our economic decisions are guided by true value and fundamentals. But this whole idea that it's synthetic money and that artificial mm -hmm. nature permeates mm -hmm. through all aspects of society. Yeah, I, the way I would uh, phrase it is that w what fiat money lets you do is suspend reality, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you can certainly see that with zombie companies and so on. The, the more money you inject, the longer they can live, even though they really should be dead. Um, you can do that in a lot, of, a lot of other things. You can sort of suspend reality by pumping money into it because it changes the incentives, at least for some short amount of time, uh, to sort of play with that, you know, suspended reality. So if the government says, for example, um, you know, uh, this this is the reality and we're, we're going to pump a lot of money into it, then a lot of people are going to pretend that that's true just to receive that money. And the most vocal supporters will be the rent seekers that are benefiting from that new, uh, the money that the government is uh, pumping in. And it's not just governments, it's a, it's a lot of entities that have access to these loans that are, uh, that, that, that can just sort of like spread it out. Um, this is happening, I think, a lot in politics where uh, you, know, you pump money into a particular issue, then you can get a lot of people to believe it, whether it's true or not, uh, as a as a way to influence uh, the the issue at hand. So, uh, you know, ultimately, all 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 of that means that we, you know, fake money makes fake things, and you you can only suspend reality for so long before sort of things collapse on themselves. And what do you say to people that would argue Bitcoin? It's fake money, fake internet magic money. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, they haven't studied Bitcoin enough. I, I, I would say that you, you need to really look at Bitcoin and what it is and how it works uh, before you make a judgment like that. Now, I get it. It is digital and digital things have uh, are fairly easily changeable. If you've ever like edited a, in a, an image or an audio file or a video, you know, it's like, oh, it's very easy to change. It's not the case with Bitcoin. It's a very different thing from a technical perspective. It is digital, scarce, and um, you know, absolute in, a, in some way that other things are not. Uh, and once you study it and understand it, uh, how it's a ledger that's unchangeable without you know putting in significant, significant parts of uh, amounts of energy, uh, then then you get to understand that this this is something solid and it's based on math. Uh, uh, not like physical reality with like gold, for example, but it is based in math and it is sort of a metaphysical reality that it's based in. So that's what I would say. So the concluding line of the book, and again, you go on to give more examples in, in greater detail and with factual substantiation. And again, I, I recommend everybody actually reads the book. Um, you, you do conclude essentially that fiat must be destroyed, right? Th those are your closing <laughs> lines here. To fiat must be destroyed to preserve civilization, fiat de l'ende est. Okay. How are we going to destroy fiat? I think it's done one person at a time. And this is uh, this was my frustration with all of the gold bugs. Uh, we, we talked about gold earlier. A lot of people 
want to destroy fiat, but it's it has to be for gold to come back. It has to be done sort of legislatively. You have to get enough people to agree to sort of flip back to a gold standard or something like that. Um, and I just don't think that's politically realistic. There are too many incumbents and people benefiting from it to sort of vote against their own interests. What Bitcoin lets us do is to individually opt out of the fiat system. So if you go and get on a Bitcoin standard instead of a fiat standard, well, you don't have that much exposure to the fiat game. I, I mean, you still pay for things, but you convert as you need or whatever. Um, that means that you are on a different standard than, uh, than the people that are in fiat. And you get enough of that, then it's got its own momentum. You get your own community. You get uh, more people using the sounder form of money. Uh, then the fiat system sort of collapses in on itself because it needs productive people to feed it in order to continue sustaining. But if, it can't steal from, if the government can't steal from you through inflation, then they're going to go bankrupt. So that's, that's the way in which I think we, we uh, destroy fiat is by starving the beast. Starving the beast by adopting Bitcoin. Yes. As our money, as our store of value, as our independent way to opt out of the system. That's correct. And it's a beautiful sentiment, which <laughs> I wholeheartedly endorse on many levels, particularly the libertarian aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But here's my concern, Jimmy. Bitcoin is, as we've discussed, and many would argue, perfectly perfect money, perfect yeah. sound money. But now we're bringing Bitcoin into the system. Mm -hmm. When we've got these spot Bitcoin ETFs, for example, should they get approved? And it looks likely that they will get approved. We're bringing Bitcoin back into the traditional system. People are not going to be exposed to Bitcoin as a self-custodied form of money that they're using as a currency but could have exposure to it mm -hmm. while it's effectively centralized mm -hmm. under the custody of giant institutional players, part of this broken fiat system, mm -hmm. you know, of which we discussed. So if, if we have these big banks, mm -hmm. big asset managers like BlackRock, for example, who's looking most likely to get the spot Bitcoin ETF approval, come into the game, mm -hmm. right? $10 trillion of assets under management. Mm -hmm. The speculation is that you'll get several ETFs approved at once. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have, by some estimates, $19 trillion of assets under management now able to move into Bitcoin. They won't obviously allocate all of that. You'll have spot Bitcoin ETFs. So retail investor hears about this Bitcoin thing, wants to get into the space, too lazy, it's too complicated to figure out wallets, exchanges, a self-custody, buys the ETF. Are we then really adopting Bitcoin if it's not working as a currency and it's effectively centralized with these institutions that monopolize much of the supply? And sure, people have exposure to it, but they're still trapped in the system that way. Yeah, I, I would say that that's the first step out. <laughs> it's, it's certainly not the last step. You're not out of the fiat house yet by taking that step, but it's at least a step in the right direction. But is it a step in the right direction? I mean, my, my point is, is that mm. we have this pure money and now yeah. we're, we're putting all of these mm. synthetic products on it that are part of the system that we're trying to get out of. Are we not ruining Bitcoin mm. by doing that, right? When you have this adoption through spot Bitcoin ETFs, it's not true adoption. It's not becoming independently able to monitor your own store of value and to use that as a medium of exchange. If, if Bitcoin is sitting on a, you know, under BlackRock's custody, it's not being used as, mm -hmm. as currency, right? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I mean, and, this is a big point of concern for me as, as we're seeing this. Yeah, and, 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 it's, uh, and for those people, they're really using Bitcoin sort of more as an investment, right? The, as a savings vehicle. And, you know, they may or may not get burned by that. Uh, if, you, if you do have an ETF, the thing that they can do is fractional reserve, reserve lend, or like, I, I guess the equivalent would be something like a naked short on, on that ETF and expand the supply. Right. But the thing is, uh, if you do that, then there is incentive on the other side to... Withdraw the, uh, withdraw the actual Bitcoin. And because there's a fixed limit, there is an absolute scarcity here. They're not, uh, and you with, uh, you know, the right parties just sort of withdraw a lot of the Bitcoin from them and get actual delivery of the Bitcoin. Well, they, they can only play that game for so long before they're exposed, at which point all the people that have money in those 
will go go get wrecked and they'll learn a painful lesson but they will go towards this uh, more you know self sovereign self custody sort of thing uh, and and I think that kind of needs to happen because most people are not very comfortable with self custody of almost anything almost every asset has been transitioned towards custody by somebody else and you your your sort of uh uh, ownership is on some ledger somewhere, and who knows what's happened to that ledger? I mean, we we found out even with something like stocks, you know, there's way more shares than there existed, and yeah. and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I, I think people will get burned, uh, you know, at some point if these ETFs act badly uh, and do naked short and uh, fractional reserve lend or whatever, um, and they they will come towards uh, you know the closer step the the actual real thing of you know custodying their own coins and being sovereign over their own wealth uh, there are checks though and that that and this is why like fractionally reserved banks during the gold standard era you know went bankrupt on a regular basis is you know you, if you do play those games and you you get a, you know uh, a run on the bank I guess a run on an ETF equivalent, uh, th- those are going to get hurt pretty bad. And the reputation of a BlackRock, if they did something like that, would completely crumble. Um, and that, uh, you know, they can't paper over it by like printing more money, which is what <laughs> investment banks have been doing for ages now. Uh, instead, they'll, they'll, they'll have to like uh, buy it on the market and cause the price to go even higher. I mean, th- there is the concern yeah. that as you're touching on now, yeah. if you have, you'll have more paper Bitcoin than real Bitcoin. Now, granted, with Bitcoin, it's a lot easier to take custody and ask to take your Bitcoin than you, than you can with gold. But, you know, we see it happening in the gold market, in the silver market. Big players like JP Morgan gets exposed, spoofing the price of silver, get a slap on the wrist, pay a small fine yeah. compared to the trade and, and, and business as usual. And, and again, for me, I think that for fear to be destroyed, mm-hmm. It's not just about Bitcoin adoption through institutions. It's about yeah. self custody yes. of Bitcoin. Yeah, and uh, and this is a pro- this is a difference between gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Is that taking delivery of gold or silver is extremely difficult. Um, if you do want to get uh, delivery of a gold bar from a gold, gold vault, it's a significant amount of money. Uh, it takes a few days and everything else, and then you have to figure out where you're going to store that thing afterwards. Uh, Delivery of Bitcoin significantly easier. So I think that exit uh, from an ETF of redemption is going to be a lot more attractive if there's even a hint of any kind of fractional reserve banking through paper Bitcoin or naked shorting or whatever. Um, and, and I think that's what will keep the check on a lot of these. Uh, a lot of these ETFs are going to know that that's the case. Uh, once one blows up and then everybody else is going to be scrambling. And if you do get a lot of these redemptions and they're exposed to be um, to be uh, insolvent, uh, then they'll they'll face real consequences instead of just sort of slaps on the wrist and bailouts and things like that, which they're all used to. It'll, it'll be a little bit of a wake up call when once one of these things happens, because like you're, you're not going to be able to paper over a loss of Bitcoin easily. Well, I, I hope that. Um that doesn't happen in the sense that things don't spiral to, to that level and that the general sentiment of sound money is upheld through Bitcoin. And again, for me, I think a big component of that, at least in my opinion, is, is maintaining it in its purer form and not bringing it in to a system. But the overall sentiment, Jimmy, that fiat has led to a lot of problems, the root of Maybe not all evil, but, but a lot of evil in society. Um, certainly can agree with that. And again, you point that out in various ways in the book. So fiat ruins everything. Recommend everybody gets it. And thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasant conversation. Fantastic. And as always, thank you for watching. I'm Michelle McCory for me and the rest of the Kitco team at Pacific Bitcoin. Thank you for watching. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and we will see you next time. This is Kitco News special coverage of the Pacific Bitcoin Festival in Los Angeles, California.